Hello, everyone. I'm just tuning in. I, you've made it to the Astronomy Online Solar Eclipse 2021. It's a celebration and it's it's a, a, a time to learn and, and see what it is you know and don't know. And we're here for you at the American Museum of Natural History. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson. That's where I serve as director of the Hayden Planetarium. And I'd like to think of myself as your personal astrophysicist, uh, and I'm your host for today. But I'm not the actually the one who's gonna be taking you on a trip through the universe for this. Uh, but that YouTube spaceship will launch in just a couple of minutes, but I gotta make some quick announcements. And let me check my notes here. Uh, we'll be paying attention to your flow of questions that show up in the YouTube chat. And we'll be selecting some of those to answer on screen. So you can try out the chat feature yourself and do tell us where you hail from. We like knowing what the reach is of our programming at all times. We're also joined, you won't see them, but we're joined by Mary Jimenez and Lauren Williams. They will be monitoring the chat and actually interacting with you while the rest of us are actually putting on the show. So that way we get you both ways, however you uh, want to be uh, received by us. They're experts on the universe, of course, why would we bring you anything less? And so uh, they'll help field the questions that come in today. Uh, as a reminder, the museum, the American Museum of Natural History, the Upper West Side of New York, we are open and we hope to see you soon post COVID. Um, we, we originally had restricted hours, restricted attendance. We are open now, okay? What you need to do is just visit amnh.org to uh, find out what the hours are and what the latest exhibits are. One of them is called The Creatures of Light. And check that one out. That's a, um, it's of course, it's a natural history museum. You learn about animals that interact with light, that produce light. Check it out. It's, it's a stunning display of this branch of the tree of life that we all live with here on Earth. And also, June 12th, that's just in a week or so. Uh, we have the newly renovated Allison and Roberto Mignone Hall of Gems and Minerals. This has been closed for a while. It just reopened and it is stunning. If you have any attraction to sparkly minerals that exist in this earth, um, we've got it here, fully redone. So now it's my pleasure and honor to introduce to you uh, my friend and fellow astrophysicist, Jackie Faraday. Jackie, there you go. And planetary scientist Marina Gemma. And she will, in fact, be our navigator for this mm -hmm. software that we're going to introduce you to called Open Space. So tell us what Open Space means, you guys. Yeah, so Open Space is a free open source data visualization software that's actually funded by NASA. And it takes data from places like NASA and visualizes them so you can interactively explore the universe. And it's free to download at openspaceproject.com. We have the website up here on the banner for you. And I really encourage you guys to, to check it out. And this is what we'll be using today to kind of preview what the eclipse next week will look like. So, so in the old days, there would just be sort of the stars of the night sky mm -hmm. on this sort of flat 2D projection. So open space is using this third dimension, which is a hard earned dimension in the data of the universe, knowing how far away something is. But once you know, then we, okay. we slap it up into the system, into the computer and you tell me open space can take you wherever you want to go. It's, it's why we call mm -hmm. it the AMH YouTube spaceship, because we can literally launch off the surface of the earth and then just head out, check out the other planets, check out stars. That's one of my favorite things to do. Fly amongst the stars and see and, where yeah. are located. It's great. All the way out to the Jackie, cosmic microwave background. I've always known that. I do, I live among the stars. Background. Stars. Know, live among stars. <laughs> and, and, and Marina, how far does it, uh, the, we have the data out to what distance? The cosmic microwave background. You can all, can't get farther than all that. The way. Nope, can't. <laughs> but we could go there in open space. <laughs> All right, take it away. I'm here. I'm more as, as, a, as much a spectator as anybody else, because well, this will be the first time I've seen this full presentation. So go for it. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, we'll go to you, Neil. If you have commentary, you can just jump in. I know you love anything astrophysical. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Um, but, but but before we begin, we do have to say uh, we're going to showcase for you what's happening on June 10th. We're going to explain everything about it. But the thing we're also going to be doing is telling you that you should be looking at the sun, which is never safe to do. So we have to say that this viewing experience that we're going to talk about is best done with Eclipse viewing glasses. I don't know if anybody has a pair laying around. I was going to have some, but I don't have them in front of me. They're kind of hard to get right now, but you might have a pair laying around from the 2017 eclipse. Um, so you want to put those on for the experiences we're telling you about, or we've got a link in the chat that we'll put in for recommendations for good activities for how to project the sun safely somewhere so that you can see it without actually staring at the sun. And so we want to put that out there um, that you can have that. Okay, now. And just to remind people that 2017 eclipse, that was the one that went straight across across the entire continental United States of America. And so uh, anyone who was around then probably had access to eclipse glasses at that time. Yeah, and you guys could put it in the chat if you saw the 2017 eclipse. We'd love to hear where you saw it from there. And I'll, I'll say we're gonna keep referring back to that 2017 eclipse because that might be fresh on your minds because it was such a, U.S. I know we have international people across the board watching us here, but that 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 eclipse was very U.S. centric, and so probably a lot of the school kids. If you guys are school kids in here, tell us what school you go to. You guys might remember that um, if you were in the U.S. All right. So quick description: uh, we are going to be going through this event, which is an alignment of the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun. Uh, and another way of putting it is that the moon is going to block some of the sun from our perspective. And we are going to start you over in New York. And that is because that's where the three of us are probably going to watch from. Neil, you're going to you're going to try and watch, right? I totally can wake up that early. How yeah. early? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a it's, we've, we've got the time already set in here. What time do we have it set to, Marina? So we are at 515 a.m. Eastern time. Thursday morning. Thursday morning, yes. So set your alarm, Neil. Yes, everybody set your alarms for that time. That's right before the eclipse is going mm -hmm. to, or sorry, right before the sun is going to rise. Um, that is not right before the eclipse happens. The eclipse for New Yorkers actually begins about an hour before the sunrise, but we don't see it. The sun hasn't risen yet. So we um, we get to catch it as it rises. And let's just switch right into open space here because we can just jump right in. Now we've, we're, we've got this great way of looking at it. Um, so we're just a few minutes before the sun's gonna rise above the horizon on June 10th. I have a question, Jackie or, yeah. or, or Marina. If open space is the universe, how is it we have the Manhattan skyline sitting here? <laughs> oh, that is a great question. <laughs> that is thanks to a, um, a physics professor at City College named James Hedberg that pulled the 3D model of New York, which is open source code. Uh, I think it was put out by New York City. Some mm -hmm. I, I, I want to have the right reference for everybody and we'll put it in the chat maybe at the end of this. But this is a publicly available three dimensional model of New York City that we just incorporated into open space. Oh, cool. So so open space just it doesn't care whether it's a star or a building. It's just a three dimensional grid through which we will journey. That's right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so realistic. And so, Marina, okay. where are we located right now? So we're hovering over, I would say, Midtown Manhattan. You can see the Empire State Building there to the right. And they're actually doing something special for the eclipse. Right, Jackie? Yeah, 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 yeah. So the on on June 10th, the 86th floor observation deck of the Empire State Building is going to open at 5 a.m. for 25 lucky people uh, that can go up there from this perched high point so you can get that beautiful view towards the eastern horizon uh, and watch from that space for 25 Well, Jackie, that's just cruel. We have thousands of people are watching this and you're gonna say 25 <laughs> people get to view it from the Empire. I know, it seems it seems cruel, but it is happening. And so we, you know. Okay, wait, let me add, for those who don't, who are not among whoever, however they choose the 25, some of the most interesting viewing of horizon phenomena from a city is with city the cityscape juxtaposed with the horizon which you're not gonna get if you're high up. You're gonna be looking straight to the horizon. And you're not gonna get the, the the crescent sun juxtaposed next to the United Nations or the Chrysler building. So for those who don't make it, don't worry, you'll still get good photos. 
Yeah, I'm not jealous. I'm good with where I'm going to pick a great location where I'm going to get the skyline from a low point. So, you know, it's fine. Those 25 people, you will enjoy it. But we will watch from a different spot. <laughs> All right. So here's what we can do in open space. So we can start the clock and not just quite yet, Marino, why don't we tell okay. them what we're going to set the clock to. So we're going to turn time on. Yeah, so with open space, you can not only move around in space, but you can also manipulate time. So what I'm gonna do is set time to run at two minutes per second. So we're kind of fast forwarding through the eclipse to see what it's gonna look like from New York City. And let's do it. Let's ride okay. the run. Okay, so starting at 5.15 and time's going now, two minutes per second. Sunrise is at 524, and I'm stopping now at 532. Right, and we stop at 532 because 532 in the morning for New York Eastern Time, uh, this is the moment that the maximum amount of the sun that's going to be blocked by the moon is. And that is a number about 73% of the moon will be blocked by the sun oh, the at sun. 532. Sun will be blocked. By the the sun will be blocked by the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Um, and we've zoomed in a little bit, Neil, so that we get that closer in view. Um, and they call this picture that you might see here a devil's horn view of the sun. And it's a cool photography moment. Like we were just saying, you can have the skyline of New York there. Sunrise moments are always really fun because the light's always beautiful, that golden hour when the sun is low. And at that moment, the sun is just going to rise and look a bit different. Uh, and if you do take pictures, which we are encouraging you to do, and you post them on your favorite social media channel, um, we're asking that you tag AMH so we can see where you were watching from, what kind of pictures you got. We have no idea what the weather is going to be like, and that is going to be a factor. If there's clouds on the horizon, clouds are always going to be a problem for you. Uh, but we'd still love to see what you try and capture. So tag AMH. And we might be retweeting or resharing on Instagram. So uh, just a question. If you're going to tag with the at sign, then it's not a hashtag. So which do you prefer? Well, tag AM and H and use a hashtag. We haven't decided on the hashtag yet. We'll probably declare that on social media. It'll okay. probably be okay. something like Ring of Fire 2021. Got it. Okay. Uh, yes. All right. So let's keep time going, Marina. So you know, you're in for it. You've got your cup of coffee. You've got a donut, maybe, or a really healthy granola. And you are watching the sun and the moon together in the sky. And if you keep watching until about 630 in the morning, you'll watch the moon slowly take less and less of a bite out of the sun. And so you're watching the eclipse unfold which means that you got to set your alarm. You need to get up early. You'll watch it rise 5.32 a.m. It reaches its peak. And then by 6.30, Marina, what time have we stopped it at? We're at 6.32 right now. 6.32. You, you saw it kind of get brighter in open space. That was right at the end of the eclipse. Great, yeah. And so this is a, it's a, it's a fun event for us in our location. But this event is not just happening to New York City. This is happening on the planet. And so we want to take you through other places and what's happening, what's happening with this ring of fire. And so common question that we get all the time is, where do I go to find out what the sun's going to look like for me? So we're going to switch you to a website that we highly recommend, timeanddate.com. I use this website all the time. They, they have very accurate times, a wealth of information. And so if you go to that and under the, the sun and moon tab, or you'll see- well, Just to be clear, you know, any clock would have what we would be happy with calling accurate time. But time and date is linked to the atomic clock that generates all the time we all use. So- so that's what that's what Jackie means when she said it has accurate time. It has yeah. the the sort of preeminent source of time that feeds its website. So there you go. And they they really have done a wonderful job at giving historical information on eclipses. So if you're like, what was an eclipse from 150 years ago? 
you can get all that information easily with beautiful graphics on time and date. So that's the other thing I love. Their archived information is really great on the site. And so this is a 2D projection. And if you remember in the 2017 eclipse, the, what was called the Great American Eclipse from one coast to the other, we had the line of totality because that was a total solar eclipse that crossed the US. This eclipse, this is the map, right? This is the map you would commonly be seeing. It's a, an image of the earth and the paths that you're seeing that the eclipse is gonna go. But this, <laughs> this one looks weird. The red uh, arc there, is the arc that's showing the locations that are gonna fall in a place where they will see the ring of fire around the sun. So the moon is not going to be close enough to the earth on June 10th to completely block the sun. So we call this an annular eclipse and we'll bring up the banner on that in a second. But um, instead it blocks a percentage. For those that are going to be in the ring of fire red area there, they'll see about 89% of the moon uh, blocking the sun, but a ring around it of fire that the, that the sun will be peeking through. Now the other shaded areas there are less and less of the sun is blocked. It's, um, it's trying to give you a visualization of where what you might have there but it's so weird because it's a 3d globe and this happens to be a pole crossing eclipse so let's switch into the 3d mode soleil and soleil by 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 the way is running things behind the scenes whenever we switch to the web viewer so hi soleil and you're doing a great job um okay so there you go that's what it actually looks like where the red line is showing you the path of those that are in the ring of fire area. And the shaded areas are the locations on the planet which see a portion of the sun blocked by the moon. So actually we're, we're very curious in the chat, um, where are you guys gonna watch from? Where's your locations? And we can plug it in here just to show you how you can use this website to figure out something good about um, so like what the conditions are for you, what it's gonna look like, how much of the sun is blocked. But Jackie, mm -hmm. other than like Boston and New York, this map covers places where hardly anybody lives. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. Northern yeah. Canada, the Arctic, you know, Santa Claus would maybe get a good view here. Yeah. So uh, I'm betting many people just across the country would just have no idea this eclipse ever occurred. Yeah. Yeah. It is true. I mean, we're talking about it a lot because the northern part of the US is definitely getting a cool pho photography moment for a sunrise partial eclipse. But those that are in the ring of fire arc there, I mean, most of that is tundra. <laughs> you can't even access the area. So um, the elk will have a good view and that's about it. The elk and yeah. the caribou. Yeah. So, so I saw in the chat earlier on, someone asked, Do, would a, does, uh, does an annular eclipse offer any sort of scientific value beyond just being a photogenic moment? What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, I I think it does. It definitely does. Scientists are constantly studying moments that eclipse happen. I cannot think of something off the top of my head that's an, a good annular eclipse scientific. Can you can you Neil of a good? No, not really. I, I you know I I've always thought of them as fun scientific moments. I mean fun photogenic moments because when the sun is completely covered, as in a total solar eclipse, then you can see like the solar corona. You can see parts of the sun not otherwise visible because the brightness of the sun just washes it out. But here the sun remains visible, and so it's just a weird freaking thing to happen to the sun, and a little spooky if you didn't otherwise know yeah. what was going on. Yeah, no, it's really true. Um, mm -hmm. And so we can't think of one off the top of our heads, but there are eclipses usually do offer like a lunar eclipse can offer a moment to study aspects of the Earth's atmosphere as reflected from the moon. We're going to get to that. There was an awesome Hubble Space Telescope study of a total lunar eclipse where the Hubble actually pointed at the moon while it was eclipsed. Uh, and I mean, it's a very rare usage of Hubble. So we do science during eclipses. Um, but I can't think of something good for an annular. Uh, okay, let's switch back over. And um, it looks like, do we have somebody from Toronto there that I just saw say, why don't we try Toronto? Let's just see what's going to happen in Toronto and look at what it's going to be like in that location. So I use this website, plug in your location. And as you can see there for Toronto, 
Sunrise is at 535 in the morning for them. And they will get 80% of the sun covered at the maximum time of 540 in the morning. And for them, it ends at 637. So check it out. Try it. Put your location in. Go to timeanddate.com and, um, and, and, and then take pictures and, and let us know how it ends up unfolding for you. All right. Now let's go back to the power of open space. Now, Marina, you've got us now. We've launched off on our open space rocket ship, and we are now above in a bird's eye view. How far away are we from, from the Earth right now? We're about 20,000 kilometers away, so much okay, further so clearly than the space clearly birds station. don't fly that high, so <laughs> no. can't we call it the bird's eye view? Yeah, Spaceship eye view, maybe. I'm thinking, yeah, yeah. But can't we use bird's eye view as just like a phrase, right? Doesn't okay. that <laughs> I'm not implying birds here. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll, I'll allow it. You'll allow it. <laughs> As a colloquial phrase, bird's eye view. Even though yeah. the bird would suffocate and die, but okay. That's right. <laughs> let's, let's not go into that. There's a lot of kids. Okay, so um, now we're at this, per we're beyond where the astronauts are in the International Space Station, mm -hmm. where a lot and, of the satellites are. Yeah, and we're, time is set at about 4 a.m. Eastern or 8 a.m. GMT. All right. So a Perfect. little bit before sunrise for New York. And, gonna... and and that's just, we picked that because it's just before the whole, the, the first location on the planet will see the partial, right, Marina? This is right before it. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to run time again, but this time I'm going to speed it up to five minutes per second so we can see the eclipse's path across Earth's surface. Yeah. So I'll start now, Jackie. Let's do it. Let's look. And so Marina's going to, We'll move time. And now you see this large concentric circle there, which is marking all of the locations on the planet. Anything that falls under that shadow looking figure is a place on the planet which will see a portion of the sun blocked by the moon. Now, the amount that you'll see will really depend on where you are in reference. And Marina, let's pause time because we've got a second circle that just showed up. Mm -hmm. So we pause time. What time did we pause it at here? So we're at about 1030 GMT. Okay, about 1030 GMT. And now, okay, so if you are under any portion of this larger circle, you will see a portion of the sun blocked. The ones closer to the edge will see just a small amount of the sun blocked by the moon. But if you fall in that, that red circle at the center there, that is the area that is the group or the locations on the planet that will see the ring of fire, that will actually see the maximum amount of the of the eclipse that is gonna happen will be in that location. So if we keep running time, you can watch where that smaller circle ends up going. So it will cross over Greenland. This is where Santa gets a little bit of a look, Neil, because <laughs> North Pole. Right over the North Pole. Right over the North Pole. And then off we go to the other side. So then Siberia, northern Russia is going to get um, the last of it on, on this side. Oh, looks like we've got a question coming up. Question from Dawn about proper solar observing equipment such as Lunt. Would an annual eclipse give you a better viewing opportunity of prominences and flares? Uh, you don't, you still don't see the corona. Like if, people might remember the 2017 eclipse. When we got into totality, when the sun was fully blocked, you got to see prominences going off. But in this case, you're seeing the, you're still seeing a huge amount of the um, disk of the sun. So it, 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 you don't really get those prominences and flares because it's all blown out by the light coming from the sun. And, and I would add that because uh, I saw how the word annular was spelled in that question. This is an annular eclipse, not an annual eclipse. An annular, that word, is it, it's an unfortunate word, but we're kind of stuck with it. Uh, it comes from the Latin annulus means ring, which means ring. So that's how an annular eclipse got its name. Nice. That's good info. Yeah. Uh, all right, so we've we've um, we've made it through to that full circle. Now we want to show you also what it does actually look like from space when we have an eclipse, and for that we're going to actually have Sole switch over to a tweet 
that came from astronaut Chris Cassidy while he was on board the International Space Station. On June 21st of 2020, there was an annular eclipse. And look at these pictures. I love following astronauts on social media because they have the best pictures. <laughs> And there you have it. So that's planet Earth. You've got clouds there. That's part of the International Space Station that's in the shot there. But see that dark area so that you can um, circle around it too, so that we're really pointing it out. Therein is the shadow that's being cast. And that, so this is an annular eclipse that was a little bit dissimilar to this one in the sense that we get at the maximum for this one, for those that are in the ring of fire area, it's about 89% of the sun blocked. In this case, it was more like 96% of the sun. I can't remember the exact number, but it was more. Uh, but there you have it. This is what it might look like from a bird's eye view, <laughs> Neil. <laughs> An astronaut's eye view. Maybe we can yep. use that accurately. Yep. Yeah. Um, and that's your view from space. And so that's also a moment we can say, like, kids, I know that we've got a lot of kids in here. Uh, you guys should follow astronauts on social media because they post some pretty darn amazing pictures, which I think are also very inspiring. All right. Let's agreed. Switch. agreed right, Marina? You <laughs> yeah. Astronauts on oh, yes. Media. Yeah. They do have the best pictures. Yeah. I wish I could have those pictures. Uh, okay. So we're back in open space because what we'd like to do is now give you another special perspective that we can give you from the uh, open space. And Marina's just turned us around. And let's pull, yep, she's getting us into a position where we can see the orbits of objects in the solar system. And that there is the Earth. And what time do we have it set at, Marina? So we're um, at 1317 GMT, but we're actually going to go back in time to about 1040 GMT. So I'm and doing that right now. Yeah. This is the time of the maximum of this annular eclipse. It's the maximum. So if you are in the path of annularity here, the path of the ring of fire, you get it for the maximum amount of time, which which is for this, this particular eclipse, about three and a half minutes where you would have the ring of fire. Now you can see from this perspective, it's a lineup. You've got the sun, you've got the moon, then you've got the earth. And the other thing that we have turned on for you are these lines. Marina, tell us about the lines. So the lines represent the paths that these two planetary bodies have taken. So the blue line represents where earth has been and the pink line represents where the moon has been. And so these are kind of just a visual aid so you can see not only where the earth and moon have been, but also the direction that they're going. And by the way, there's a famous word associated with this phenomenon. Famous, it's famous for many reasons. First, the word is just completely weird. And when written in script, it has five consecutive letters that yes. dip below the horizontal line. And it's called syzygy. You might have heard about it. S Y no, it's S Z Y G Y. It's S-Y-Z, right? S-Y-Z. S-Y-Z. S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y. -Y. There you go. Thank you, <laughs> Jackie. Um, that's an actual real astronomical word that is completely obscure. I try to avoid it at all costs, but we would have such a beautiful display of syzygy here. Syzygy is any three astronomical objects that are end up in alignment. We, we, we call that a syzygy. So right. uh, here, here you go. Yeah, and we we actually have a great question here from Marsh on why are the sun and the earth apparently the same size? Why do they overlap? And that is because while the sun is about 400 times bigger than the moon, it's, it's width bigger than the moon, the moon is about 400 times closer to the earth than the sun is. So that means, and this is taking us right into the next part of this um, talk, in the, that that means that they will appear the same angular size in the sky to you. That does not mean they're the same size at all. It just means the moon is closer to you than the sun. The sun is bigger than the moon. Um, now, this, so here's our alignment here. And I'm going to take you into the next part of that. But before I do, we do want to show you one thing, which the, there's two questions you're probably asking. Number one, 
why is this an annular? Like, why isn't it completely covering the sun if I just told you they're basically the same angular size? And the other thing you might be wondering is this is an alignment. You know the moon's going around the earth at every all the time. And so every 28 days or so, it goes from full moon and then goes into new moon. So why don't we get a total eclipse every month? And that's really well explained if you look at the pink line and the blue line here. And we're going to change time to show you how the moon's orbit around the sun, uh, around the Earth, is slightly different than the Earth's orbit around the sun. So now, Marina, what have you backed our time off to? I've kind of rewound us to June 8th, so okay. two days before the- Marina has more public. power than I ever imagined <laughs> in this. What else are you- The power of the navigator, Neil. <laughs> I know. The, space, the power of the space-time continuum. All right, there mm -hmm. you go. Uh, uh, okay, we're gonna set time, what are we setting time to? I think we'll go eight hours per second, so a little even faster than we were. Okay, and let's see. Now look at that pink line. It looks below the blue line of the Earth. And now intersection there at June 10th where it goes behind mm -hmm. uh, from our perspective. And if we keep going on, you see that the moon is now above the blue line of the Earth going around the sun. And so the orbit of the moon going around the Earth is not exactly the same as the Earth going around the sun. They're off by about five degrees. And that's why any given month when it's full, it could miss. It misses covering the sun for you because it's not aligned perfectly. Uh, and so you don't get one every month, though we have a fun fact on how many you do get. So on any given year, eclipses are actually not that rare. You get a minimum of four, and that's lunar eclipse and solar eclipse, not just solar eclipse, and a maximum of seven eclipses each year. So that's the max that you can get. But you're and just to be clear, those one. are partial eclipses as well as total eclipses. And the total eclipses are, of course, rarer than that, but still not particularly rare. Once every two to three years, you get a total mm -hmm. solar eclipse. Right. So, yeah. And the press yeah. will always try to tell you they're rare and they're just not. That's just. <laughs> well, I like to use the word rare only when it's something that's really only going to happen once in my own lifetime. That's when yeah, I. That's a good use of rare. There you go. Isn't that but, good? I, I'm pretty, I, I like yeah, that. I, I like that. I like that. Yeah. But uh, the fact that eclipses happen more frequently than the presidential elections, no one says rare presidential election coming up, <laughs> rare right. Olympics. No. So just chill out and, you know, just enjoy the sky without constantly thinking that the whole universe is doing something special just for you. Yeah, we definitely, that word gets misused. Yeah. And yeah. Very misused in astronomical context. So it is good to note that most of the eclipses happen over the ocean, right? Just because Earth's surface yeah. is mostly ocean. So the ones that do cross the continents that we get to see are, are exciting. Yeah. But also most of the continents are not inhabited. So even when they do happen Very over true. continents, sometimes you gotta you gotta hike to them, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, trains, planes, yeah. and automobiles to get to the best viewing spot. Uh, yeah. Okay, now we're gonna take it into why the annular part of it too, because that's the other half of what we're talking about here. So how what and what's going on on this June tenth moment, right? So okay, so Marina's gonna move us away from a perspective where we can get another. Bird's eye view. <laughs> um, <laughs> you just call contest, Jackie. I just really like saying bird's eye view. Okay, so, I don't want to stop you, you know, mess up your mojo there. That's fine. It's, it's in my head. Uh, okay, and now we're, we're now perched in a perspective where we're looking at the moon in the pink line going around the earth, which has the blue line extending off, which is going around the sun. Now, Marina, mm -hmm. let's, um, we're going to move time, but what, how much, how fast are we going to move time here? I'm going to speed it up to one day per second. Nice. Okay, so as it's going around, it really kind of looks like the moon is going around in a perfect circle. And if that were true, it would always be at the same radius away from the Earth. But it is not a perfect circle. It is an elliptical orbit. So as it goes round and round and round the Earth, sometimes it's a little bit closer and sometimes it's a little bit further away. And in this particular month, the month that the cycle that it's currently in, it reached its closest, which we call perigee. That's the word that we use in astronomy to describe when something is at its closest approach. The perigee 
was actually reached on May 26th. And then the farthest approach is going to be June 8th, which is two days before this annular eclipse. So at the point of June 10th, when we get the alignment, when we get our syzygy, you <laughs> unfortunately are too far away for the moon to be fully blocking, um, for, to, to, for the moon to fully block the sun. We actually have a picture of what an apogee and a perigee full moon look like. So on the right hand side there is the perigee full moon. And on the left hand side is the apogee full moon. And on the text below, and you can see the dates these were taken, this is the one on the left, the apogee is February of 2006. And on the right, September of 2006. And the distances are there, 405,978 kilometers versus the 357,000 kilometers. And that difference, that, that, that distance difference makes all the difference. So we are, we are not at apogee during this solar eclipse, but we are um, close to it. So the moon, even for those that are in the ring of fire annularity area, are only seeing about 89% of the disk of the sun blocked by the moon. So, um, okay, back into open space here. And- um, I just wanna be clear, every month, the moon goes through perigee and apogee. It's not. It's just not always full when that happens, right? You can have an apogee with a crescent moon, a, a half moon, a, a gibbous moon. So it's an every month thing where that's happening. But to time it such that it's either at apogee or perigee when it's in the full phase, that's a little rarer, but it's still not, I don't think it's anything to write home about when that happens. Right, no, and I think, so people have come to like using the term super moon for a full well, moon. Get me day. started, Jackie, don't, <laughs> I know, don't I know. me on that. But, so Neil, I think whenever I get asked I'm about gonna it- I'm gonna back away from the computer. <laughs> people love the super moon word. And the better, I mean, the better term would be a perigee syzygy moon. And, sure. you know, that's what it actually hopefully is, but even that, is not a great, um, you know, it's not super, super. It is, it, it, it is though a full moon close to parody. Yeah, I would uh, just the way that I can, you can measure this in New York, we eat a lot of pizza. So you do, I did the math on this. So a super moon is to an average full moon as a 16 and a half inch pizza is to a 16 inch pizza. So if a 16 and a half inch pizza is super to you, Compared to a six, then fine. Go ahead and call it a supermoon. You got to let people have their word. In no. I don't know. <laughs> I, I love how people get excited about it. I know that it is painful because it is not what the hope is, that people have when they hear the word super. But I just hope there's enough excitement left in them. So when if a black hole shows up or if aliens land, they got enough excitement left for that. They, they right? will. I'm sure they will. Yeah. So. Okay, fine. Um, okay, but speaking of which, if we go to the date of May 26th, which if you remember that banner we just brought up, that was the uh, May 26th was when perigee happened and the moon did was full on that date. It also was when the moon was aligned. It was a syzygy. And so on that date, we had a total lunar eclipse. That was just two weeks prior to the June 10th partial eclipse. Uh, and so our fun, and so Marina, you've got us now backed into the backside, right? If we come in a little bit yes. closer to the moon. So and I'm, we're on May 26th, it's about 1 a.m. And I'll set time at one hour per second and we'll see the moon move behind the earth. And in that moment, when it moves behind the earth, so this is the, the, the uh, an alignment with the moon on the other side of the earth now, and as it passed, through that aligned, that syzygy moment, uh, it passed into the Earth's shadow. We actually have a picture that a former museum employee, Noah Berg, who's a, 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 a good friend and now an avid astrophotographer, he took this image from his location in Oregon of totality. And so this was a total lunar eclipse, May 26th. You get those nice reddish, brownish hues that are over the moon, as it's passing into the shadow of the earth, there is still some light that reaches the moon. And that light, even though the earth is blocking the sun, but the light that does reach it is, is passed through our atmosphere. And so the at, 
at during a lunar eclipse in totality, the moon is bathed in all of the sunrises and sunsets that are going on across the planet at that time. And no two uh, lunar eclipses are identical. They all have some differing amount of light, just like no two sunsets or sunrises are identical. So, yeah, so it depends on how much crud there is in Earth's atmosphere yeah. at the time of, of the eclipse. I would say that that image was a, in the partial phases because you'd see the it's lighter on one side of the moon compared to the other. Yeah, well, you're more likely cool. to see some of the light coming through the atmosphere. Um, so I don't know what they told you for that photo, but it looks like a that partial phase of what might have been a, a, a total lunar eclipse. I bet what happened was it was advertised as a blood eclipse, which is another issue that I have with the naming. And so you had to take the picture when he got this slightly amber color for it, but in totality, all that color goes away and then he can't advertise it as a blood eclipse. Yeah, so. I, I also should check because I don't know what Oregon got because the US, the sun, the moon was setting while the eclipse right it was mostly for all the residents of the pacific ocean <laughs> who, yeah. who got to see that eclipse right, right. that's right yeah. australia got a good view they were in mm -hmm. the path they had a, a yeah. full view uh -huh. um okay now marina you've taken us and so the fun fact there by the way we can bring up the banner is that um lunar eclipses and solar eclipses it's it's not coincidental that it happened a lunar eclipse is always going to occur two weeks before or two weeks after a solar eclipse. They chase each other. So don't be surprised when that, that's happening. Oh, Jackie, I have one other fun fact, or kind of obscure, actually. So all these eclipses we've been talking about, the solar eclipse, uh, solar eclipses, it depends on where you are on Earth for you to see how much of that eclipse. Whereas a lunar eclipse, there is no shadow on Earth that's happening. What's happening is the moon is entering Earth's shadow in space. So anyone who can see the moon on that side of the Earth it bears witness to that eclipse. Right. If you're on the, if you can see the moon and the moon is being eclipsed, you see the lunar eclipse, right. period. So in that sense, we don't think of them as rare as solar eclipses, even though they are. It's just that many more people get to see it when it happens. Yeah, you just have to make sure you can see the moon. But if you can see the moon, you get the event. You got it. All right, last part of this program. We are gonna, we have brought you somewhere. Marina, where have we brought it? <laughs> the good question, Jackie. And I hope you'll believe me when I say I've brought us to a spot kind of hovering over the southwestern shore of the Hudson Bay. So we picked a location in Northern Canada that is going to experience, I recalling it annularity, Jackie? Ring of fire. Instead of totality, annularity. ring of fire annularity. So um, it's just before sunrise right now, but what I'm gonna do is um, speed up time around two minutes per second again, and we will watch the sun and the moon come up over here. And so just to note, we've, we've mentioned this, but the areas, Canada is the, has got um, a lot of locations that have a great view, but much of it is uninhabited and not easy to get to. It's the tundra. But even still, this particular location, there goes the sun rising. Or actually, we need to turn the sun um, on to there, Marina, because it looks like we don't have the sun on. I think on. it is on. Here, I'll zoom in, though. It'll be a bit easier to see. Ah, okay, perfect. Oh, so, yeah. There. Yeah. It is there. And so as we rise it, um, we'll pause time at 9.56 for Six. this. Nine yes. So I'm at 9.54, 9.55. Got it. 9.56. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, this would be the moment in this location, we've zoomed in for you, where the disk of the moon is going to cover 89% of the disk of the sun lined up so you get a ring. And Soleil, we actually have an image of this from another annular eclipse that occurred in 2003, I believe. This was um, an Africa crossing annular eclipse. And somebody caught this picture of the ring of fire. We would be playing Johnny Cash right now for you in this moment, the ring of fire song. <laughs> But we don't want ring of fire. Well, oh, good. <laughs> of fire. I, I don't know all the lyrics, but I know that line. Okay. Ring of fire. <laughs> I just don't know if that means we get cut from YouTube, but hopefully not. 
Not for my rendition, I assure you. <laughs> good. You got a good baritone there, Neil. Um, okay. So there it is. The Ring of Fire. For those of you that can catch it, this is the kind of excitement that you will see in your sun. And let's switch back and just um, show for this location, the sun, just like we showed in New York, as it's rising, then you get another hour or so after that, the moon will slowly move its way away from the disk of the sun, taking the bite, the bite back out until all is normal again. And we have a regular looking sun. Jackie, I have a really obscure geeky fact. Oh, go. Okay, does everyone notice that the sun rose up and to the right? Yeah. Okay, it didn't rise straight up and down. Um, and when it sets, it sets down and to the right, if we would sort of follow that across the sky. So uh, in the TV um, soap opera, as the world turns, they would show the sunrise rising up and to the right. But then the sunset, they would show it dropping down and to the left, which meant they just reversed the, the image, okay? <laughs> Yeah. And I, I, I was in middle school, and I said, "You're not fooling me." That's okay. So, yeah. so in fact, they, I, I think I said that backwards. I think they filmed the sunset and then reversed it for sunrise because the camera people were not waking up too early enough to get the sunrise. So they just took it and reversed it. And they thought that one is just a time reverse of the other, but it's actually mm -hmm. a different angle, a 180 degree flip. So I just thought I'd put out this I, really. You, you, you told me that before, and now I. Always, if I notice that somebody clearly did it, because it is easier to film sunset and just reverse for production crews. Right, because everyone is awake at sunset rather than yeah. 5 a.m. when they're making yeah. movies. Yeah, I get pissed off when I see it in the movies, but I hold that to myself. I don't you know, okay. I try to at least. That's good. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so a fun thing too, for those of you that are going to be able to catch this, for some people, look at, look up where you're gonna, uh, where where your location is and what you're gonna see. We want to show you a kind of picture you could collect as well for these northern locations that have so much of the sun blocked. Um, we There's one called the shark fin that we wanted to show you. I love this one. I think this is such a cool photograph. So right on the horizon, does that look like Jaws? Uh, anyone? Marina? Oh, yeah. A little bit. Like a fiery shark, though, lurking back there. Yeah. <laughs> So our cosmic challenge, thank you, Neil. That was great. I also Ooh. hope that doesn't get us kicked off. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, um, I don't make a good cello imitation, but I, so what was the bass? I don't know what, what, what it was. Such a good baritone. I had no idea. Um, the so so please do share your 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 pictures and tag them on social. We we'd love to see them. These are so fun to see, and you might just have a shark fin um, mm -hmm. rising for you. But let's let's end the program on New York again, because the three of us are in New York and, you know, we love the city. Uh, Empire State Building again, 25 people special. Um, but now we're set again at uh, what time are we at, Marina? Then 5.15 in the morning, bright and early. 5.15. Set your alarms. You have to get up before the sun rises. Have your cup of coffee and your donut or your yogurt or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Uh, and and here we go. Let's rise the sun one one more time on that date, 524 sunrise. We're going to pause it at 532 in the morning. Right there. And zoom in a little. And remember, for us here in the New York area, when the sun is at this point, we have the devil's horn image. Let's swap to a devil's horn picture. Look at that. So cool. Astrophotography, man. Yeah. Love it. You'll get a little horizon. Let's see the best shots we can get, everybody. Uh, this is, we will have 73% of the sun, the, the disc of the sun blocked by the moon. And we would love to see what you guys get. Jackie, so Marina, imagine you didn't know anything about the universe or astronomy. And you worship the sun in general, as so many cultures did. And then the sun rises looking like that. I know. Man, that would be, that, that, that would be. I'd be pretty freaked freak, out. Totally freaked out. Oh, yeah. Man. I think I would figure it out. I'd be like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I think's going on? I think I would. Wait, wait, Jackie, you don't want to be too good at it. Cause if you figure it out, 
then maybe you caused it. You see, you got to watch out for that. <laughs> I know. And yeah. then I, I might be killed or something. Yeah, burned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they problem. The whole thing about that back then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, that is a great reminder. And this is this is what I want people to take away. Like, this is your moment, everybody, to remember. First of all, look up. I know you love saying that, Neil. Like, look up. And re remind yourself that we are in a bigger picture than just this planet. Like lots of stuff is going on. These are our celestial partners. The moon is our celestial partner. We move through space together. And that's our sun. And there's an alignment. And it's cool. And it's a fun, fun reminder of the full world that we live in, even though it's still in our solar system. But Maybe it gets you excited and you want to become an astronomer someday because I know there's a lot of kids in here, so you guys could be astronomers too. That's how I think about it. I think of the, the moon and planets orbit the sun in their appointed paths like, let me finish the full sentence. So it's not only do the stars, not only do the moons and the planets spin on their axis, they also orbit the sun in their appointed paths when I think of that, I think of a ballet where mm -hmm. these orbs are pirouetting dancers uh, in, or, in movement around the sun choreographed by the forces of gravity. That's beautiful. That's how oh I think God. about it. Yeah. You know, I love, I, I do this program with open space that I call our cosmic ballet, which is, takes that analogy all the way out to all of the stars because there's so much of a dance that's going on mm -hmm. in the cosmos in the milky way in the galaxy in our nearby yeah. neighborhood stars yeah. dancing with each other move and that's a nice way to think of how they're born together they move through space together we interact they pirouette together yeah pirouette <laughs> oh it's so beautiful all right so we're at the end of the program um i have a, a just a couple of announcements for the end here we're going to put a um, survey link in the chat here because we really we're always looking for ways that we can improve on our programs and your feedback is so important to us. So uh, please, please fill it out. Let us know what you think. Other programs you might want to see any of that. And anyone that fills one out today gets a NASA sticker in the mail. That's a big deal. I have cool. a NASA sticker on my laptop. Me too. Uh, Marina, you do too? Nice. Mm -hmm. And do, uh, we, do we rent Do we rent out Marina for people who want to use open space? <laughs> no, she's trying to finish her PhD. She cannot be rented out. Finish her PhD, okay. <laughs> Not yet, after the PhD. Maybe, yeah, maybe after, maybe after. Yeah, all right. Right. Yeah. Uh, and but the other I will, yeah, I will say that if you guys want to test out open space for yourself, again, it's free to download at openspaceproject.com. You know, there's tutorials and intros um, on the website and you can play around with it. It's really, really fun. It is. So, yes. Yeah. And it's all open source. So you, mm -hmm. can see the, you can actually go in and see the code and maybe even help us become a developer and help us find and put something cool new into it. Never know. Uh, all right. And then the last thing is that it has been over a year since we started doing these online programs, this YouTube spaceship, as we call it. And um, while we are looking forward to the time that hopefully is in the near future where we will start to have more in-person programs again, um, we are happy to announce that we are still gonna continue with this online series. It will continue on. Um, we will be taking a break over the summer, but um, we're back in September for these free, they're once a month, the astronomy online programs are here on YouTube. And over the summer, if you're like, ah, I want more, I wanna, you can look at our playlist. And we have a lot of different programs that we've done. We've done on Mars. I did a cosmic ballet of sorts on the Milky Way. Check that out. And, and then don't forget to subscribe to the AMH YouTube channel when you're there. And then you'll get all the notifications, especially when we start coming back online in September. And other thing, if you wanna uh, make sure that you're up to date on all of our programs, we have a newsletter called Starstruck. I feel like that goes way back, Neil, like back to the old days, right? I used to, I, back, I had an email distribution list and I called it Starstruck. In fact, it was the Starstruck email distribution list where I first used the phrase Manhattan, Manhattan Henge. Henge. And so mm -hmm. that's got tracked up into the OED. So I was very honored by that. But yeah, Starstruck has very deep history with our efforts to communicate with the interested public in cool things happening in the night sky. Yeah, 
And so you can still subscribe. It started with Neil and it was definitely how I used to, that's how I learned about Manhattan Hinge when I was just like a kid basically. And I was subscribed to it. Am I that old? Oh you know, man. I, yeah. <laughs> you know, we've known each other for a long time. But. Okay. <laughs> uh, Okay, and then we'll drop the link to Starstruck emails in there. And um, that's it. So thanks, everyone. Please watch the eclipse. Mm -hmm. Remember to tag AM and H in your social. And, take pictures. Uh, take pictures. This, uh, Neil, it was so fun having you here. This was great. Oh, yeah. Well, happy. Thanks, I didn't Neil. want to like butt in or anything. I had a couple of things to add, maybe, but it, it was your yeah. show. So. No, you, you were so fun as always. I mean, you know, you're you. So this was great. We're no, I'm just channeling the universe, and I think the universe is hilarious. So that's really what's going on here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Uh, okay, everybody. So I think that's signing off for us until September. We'll see you then. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.